Joining us today is Jose Hernandez. Jose. Jose's, uh, I would have to categorize as, as a very American miracle. Um, in 62, 1962, when John Glenn was going into orbit, Jose was born in French Camp, California. So he's a native Californian. That's a miracle in itself, right? His parents were migrant farm workers. So it's, uh, he comes from a very uh, interesting background. Uh, when he was nine, though, he was able to watch, uh, and I should say in amazement, as Apollo 17 took men to the moon on the final lunar landing flight. And I think it seems to me, based on, his, uh, on what things he said and things that have been written about him, that this really sort of grabbed him. He's had, a, had an epiphany, and I can't speak for him, but it just fired his imagination up, which is part of what the space program is, is supposed to do, because he immediately decided he wanted to become an astronaut. Jose then went on to graduate from the University of the Pacific with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 1984, and in 1986, just two years later, graduated from University of California, Santa Barbara with a master's degree, or is awarded a master's degree. So, I mean, this is really, really special. He became an engineer with the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, um, which you're all familiar with here in the Bay Area. And during his time at Livermore, he helped build, uh, or repurpose, if you will, Cold War technologies for peaceful means, and in this case, he was a fundamental uh, developer of digital t technology for digital mammography, which of course is an invaluable tool now in the early detection of breast cancer. So he's made a lot of contributions to our society. But then he went on and he applied to NASA to become an astronaut. Several times he kept trying because he really, really wanted to do that. He really wanted to go into space. After each time when he was kind of turned down, because they were looking for a different, say, mission specialist or whatever for a certain flight. Um, he continued to improve himself. He eventually got a pilot's license. He became a pilot. Well, that's not good enough for Jose. He then became a master scuba diver. That's nah, still not good enough for Jose. He went on to learn to speak conversational Russian. And I can't get past the word yet myself. So I'm, I'm, it's just astounding. Anyway, all this hard work paid off in 2004, and we reached a lifelong goal of becoming and, and being selected as a NASA astronaut. And in 2009, he flew a 14-day mission as the flight engineer on one of Space Shuttle Discovery's flights to the International Space Station, you know, where they go up and they dock at the space station, and they replenish the, the supplies and so on and so forth. So he, during those 14 days, he orbited the Earth 217 times before the mission ended. And this particular mission was one of the few that came down at Edwards Air Force Base here in California. I'll bet he wanted to do a flyover, a flyby over the old homestead, but they probably didn't let him do it. Now, you'd think that's enough for one lifetime, but not our Jose. So right now, not wanting to rest on past laurels, Jose is currently running for Congress from District 10 in Modesto. And you know, if, any, if anybody's ever going to kick Obama out of the presidential office, I got my bet right here on Jose. So let's welcome Jose Hernandez. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Right, no problem. Thank you very much for this uh, great introduction, Bob. And uh, and also, I'm glad to see that we have a full crowd. I saw they had to take out other. Uh, seats uh, and unfold them to uh, so accommodate and, and I'm very happy to be here, uh, ecstatic to be here. I was able to uh, also take advantage and bring my two sons uh, here to, uh, to attend so that they can learn a little bit more about the history of the USS Hornet and so I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce my two sons. Uh, for the oldest one who's going to start college, Julio Hernandez, stand up. Be more like a, a church sermon 
in the sense that uh, you know when I was in when I went to uh, to church here in Stockton with the family, my my parents always used to tell us uh, you know to behave in church, right? It says you know don't elbow your brother and don't pinch your sister, and uh, if you guys behave and don't make us look bad as parents, you know the reward will be we'll take you out for ice cream after mass, right? <laughs> and that was always the reward. That was the you know that that was the carrot they dangled. So, uh, you know, there's too many of you for me to uh, buy ice cream for, so I'm not going to dangle that carrot in front of you. But the carrot I am going to dangle in front of you is, is that towards the end, the second half of my presentation will consist of a video, about 18 minutes, that summarizes my 14-day uh, mission up into space. So it includes everything from the blast-off to us uh, floating in space, uh, eating food, and all the way down to the landing at Edwards Air Force Base, as, as Bob uh, had mentioned. Uh, but the first I like to do is I like to talk a little bit and Bob alluded to it a little bit is how I got there How, how was it that that someone? Uh, who uh, whose uh, parents? Immigrated from Mexico as migrant farm workers and lived here in the Central Valley was able to uh, Basically reach the American dream and be able to become a US astronaut and uh, and let me tell you the story goes back when I was a kid First of all, there's four of us in our family, and I am the youngest one, and, uh, and I was born here out of sheer luck, because as a migrant farm working family, uh, we spent nine months here uh, chasing, basically working in different crops uh, along the Central Valley, and three months in Mexico. And so a brother and I were born in August and September, respectively, and guess where we were born? We were born here. I have a sister and a brother who were born in December. Guess where they were born? They were born in Mexico. So it's just out of sheer luck. I was, uh, I was born here in the States. Uh, it wasn't until my second grade teacher, though, uh, as we used to move year after year, it wasn't until my second grade teacher came over to my parents' house and basically read them the riot act for, leave, for leaving uh, school and being away from school for three months that my parents finally decided to make Stockton, California our home. And that's where we started uh, staying there year round and that's when our education uh, got a lot of traction. Now, what happened when, uh, uh, you know, how was it that I wanted to become an astronaut? Well, unfortunately, I have to, uh, I have to confess that I'm old enough to remember the uh, tail end of the Apollo program. Uh, now, just the very tail end. I don't remember the beginning, but I remember the tail end. And I remember this one specific mission. It was Apollo 17. Uh, it was the very last mission. We haven't been to... Uh, to the moon since then, if you can believe that, uh, which is over 40 years ago. And, 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 and I remember, I remember it was, uh, 19, it was uh, 1972. I was all of nine years old. And, and, and I remember, um, you know, when the Apollo missions were occurring, you know, regular programming would get preempted, right? You would have Walter Cronkite narrating the, uh, the, the, the moonwalks. And, uh, and Apollo 17 was no different. Uh, here we were uh, watching it on our old black and white TV. You guys remember those old console TVs, vacuum tube TVs that were uh, you know, made out of wood. It was a big, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was basically a piece of furniture is what it was, right? With the integrated speakers and a big hunky knob to change the channel. And, uh, and then of course, that time, we, those days we didn't have satellite TV. I think cable was coming out, but I know we, didn't, we couldn't afford it. So, uh, so, so, uh, so we had the next best thing, uh, bless you, we had the next best thing, which was the uh, rabbit ear antennas, right, on top of the TV. And, and so uh, I'll share a little story about, about the, that whole TV thing, because I think it's, it's amusing and, and uh, entertaining, especially for the kids that sort of scratch their head and can't understand this concept. But, uh, but, but it used to be that um, when, when it, we wanted to change the channel, we had to get up and change the channel, right? And, and, and I remember uh, when, when there was a family with kids, well, that was the great thing for our father because he didn't have to change the channel. He would just tell the kids, right? And when you're down on the totem pole on the kid list, which I was, I was the youngest one, I was the one that, 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 that had to do it, right? I remember one day I was sitting with my dad and, and, and he said, and you know, his signal for me to change the channel was he would just elbow me, right? Change the channel. So I would get up and change the channel, sit down. You know, a few seconds later, he would say, change the channel. Get up and change it. 
And he must have done this one day, I don't know, maybe I was in a bad mood or something, uh, but he must have done this about nine times, right? And, and, and I, I figure, man, if he tells me to change the channel again, I'm gonna say something. And you, and you gotta understand my dad, you don't say something to my dad. Because he's the type that is very strict and you talk back to him, and he's gonna pop you over the head, right? And, 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 but, but you gotta understand my frustration, because this was gonna be the tenth time. And you remember back in those days, with rabbit ear antennas, you only get three channels. Right? So we're going around in circles. I, I, I say, you know, the old man couldn't make up his mind, right? So that's what, that's what I was thinking. So, tenth time comes around, he tells me, change the channel. I said, uh-oh. Well, it's time to man up. I better tell him something. But before I do, I said, before I do, I, I told myself, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of a couple of things, right? I said, first, I said, I'm going to go ahead and change the channel so he can't accuse me of having a disobedient kid, right? You go and change the channel, then you complain. Okay? Second, I said, uh, I'll be darned if I sit right next to him. You know, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit beyond the arm radius, right? So I sat clear on the other side of the sofa, right? And, uh, so he, and he noticed I sat on the other side of the sofa and he looked at me and so I didn't think anything about it. So I sat down after I changed the channel the 10th time and I said, okay, time to man up and time to tell him, you know, about, about uh, you know, changing the channel so many times, time to complain. But like a budding engineer that I am, I, whenever there's a problem, I want to present a solution, right? So I, so I start talking to my dad and I said, hey dad. He said, yes son, stern voice. So now I'm blabbling out like the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? I said, did you know that at Kmart, they have new TVs with remote controls? You know, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I, I, probably I was hoping my dad would say, well, yes, son, let's go down and buy one. You know? Well, that clearly wasn't gonna happen. And, 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 and my dad has a way of twist, twisting things around that, you know, for his benefit, that you guys ever say anything you regret it and you kind of want to get those words back in your mouth? That's how kind of, that's how I felt like, because I could just picture him getting up and slapping me and saying, you ungrateful kid, you know, here you have a TV and now you want, uh, now you want one with a remote control, right? And, and, and so, I don't know how it is in your family, but whenever you say something bad, there's the three second rule. If he doesn't get up in three seconds, that means you made it, you're, not, you're safe. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that dumb of a thing you said. So I couldn't count to three seconds quick enough. And then, uh, and then the, second, the, second, uh, the second test is you gotta make eye contact with him. And so, and you better not be in a, uh, I guess a challenging, uh, looking at him, challenging him. You better have the fear of God in you. And, and sure enough, I, I finally got the nerve to, uh, to turn around and look at him and make that eye contact. And of course, he's staring me down at that point. And, and, uh, and Maybe that little bead of sweat coming down my forehead helped me out because I did have the fear of God. And you know, that, that angry look in his face quickly turned to a look of pity. And you know, kind of like saying, I can't believe this is my kid. And he said, son, son, son. He says, now why would I want to go and buy a TV with a remote control when I have you? <laughs> so obviously, obviously I was the remote control of the family. And that, that bloody TV kept on working for another two years. And so I was the remote control for another two years. But aside from being the uh, remote control of the family, I was also the official antenna adjuster. Whenever, you, you guys remember those uh, antennas when a plane passed by or something, the signal always got me messed up, right? And then we always had snowy picture, always had that uh, vertical, that horizontal sink, that black bar coming up the picture, moving up the screen, and you had to sort of hit it on the side to fix it. That was our TV. So when something important came on, my dad would also tell me, adjust the TV. And of course, I would grab the antenna, and uh, now I know this because I'm an electrical engineer, but you basically become an extension of the antenna when you grab it, right? And the picture improves, right?